Hello everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I have been testing uh, open source software for the last 10 years. Uh, this is how to reach me if you if you like. And this is how I look. No, pretty close. So uh, today I'm going to talk about mutants and zombies, but uh, not the ones from the movie. Uh, slightly different. And uh, I have some code examples. Uh, so first, let me get a, get an idea. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Python, at least to some degree? Uh, okay, good. And uh, how many of you are familiar with Ruby? Okay, great. Uh, so don't don't worry. Uh, the examples are not very uh, hard to understand. So let's take uh, this piece of code. Uh, it's a, a simple class uh, describing uh, one model. In a Rails application, there's only one field that goes into the database. Uh, and uh, this is only one method, uh, which is actually you know, a really stupid method, just returns an uppercase string of that field. Uh, and uh, as you can see from this screenshot, uh, this class has 100% uh, code coverage. And uh, uh, the question that uh, I'm asking myself uh, as a tester, and the question that I expect everybody should be asking themselves here is, uh, is my test suite good enough? And good enough in terms uh, whenever there's some change uh, in the software under test. Uh, is my test suite able to detect uh, if this change will break something or the change goes undetected and, and possibly goes into production and something bad really happens. And uh, mutation testing can help you answer this question. Uh, but first, uh, I need to explain what a mutation is. Um, so a mutation is uh, usually a very small change in the software. Uh, which uh, somehow changes the behavior of the software. Uh, mutations can uh, can come from comparison operator and if statements. And if we take the example on the screen, it's uh, the mutation is replacing the greater than operator with a less than operator. And if you apply this mutation to your code and read it, it becomes if h is less than 18, then buy beer. <coughs> now imagine that you are an online store and suddenly you know you start doing this, sell beer to small children, and this is not good. Then uh, another possible source of mutations is uh, constant values. You can replace uh, these values with something else. And in this example, we replace true to false. And because it's very early in the morning yet, if we didn't have our coffees, we would be looking like this. Another possible source of mutations is uh, loops. Uh, we may, uh, for example, modify the loop condition or in this example, we may uh, change break to continue, and we get an endless loop. And when you have a endless loop, this is what happens. So this is again an example from production, and all my examples are taken from production environments today. <laughs> well, not the beer one, but... <laughs> uh, by definition, uh, mutation testing is uh, a technique, and also the tools for mutation testing. They modify your software under test, they don't modify your test suite. You know, you keep the test suite separate. And you, for each uh, mutant that is produced in your software under test, you execute the test suite again and again and again. And uh, this gives you a pretty good idea at the end uh, how good your test suite is. Uh, well, it can tell you places where you have tests, uh, but they don't, go, they, don't, they don't do a very good job of uh, finding um, you know, all possible things that may change. Or uh, they, they can also I'll tell you places where you have missing tests, uh, but you already know this, you know, because you, we use coverage. Uh, so mutation testing is really good for telling you uh, where you need to, to make better tests. Uh, and the idea behind this is uh, some of the mutations which you see and which the tools support uh, try, to, uh, try to mimic uh, errors which developers may, uh, may do uh, while writing code, for example, you know, plus one, minus one errors, uh, delete something by accident, and you know, just commit this to source control, uh, stuff like that. And uh, other mutations uh, you, which uh, you may see, uh, you know, they, they are purely artificial, but somehow they, they help us uh, validate the, the test conditions, the test environment which uh, we run our tests within, and you know, help us expose uh, something that's missing. Uh, the algorithm for mutation testing is uh, actually very simple. Uh, so we, we run three loops 
one after the other. First one is we go through the own, own mutation operators that uh, our two in particular can support. These are stuff uh, which the two knows how to change uh, with something else, uh, regardless of whatever that, that else may be. Uh, then for each uh, operator, we find uh, the places in the source code uh, where that operator is used and replace it with something else. Uh, most, uh, mutation, most operators uh, and conditions can lead to only one uh, another type of mutation, but some, sometimes uh, you can produce uh, different mutations for only one, one place in the code, like with the comparison operators. And then, of course, you execute the test suite. Uh, there are three uh, simple rules to kill mutants, uh, which, you, which you must remember. Uh, first, uh, when you execute uh, the test suite against the non-modified version of the program, uh, everything should pass, and this is a hard requirement, you cannot go without it. If something fails, obviously, uh, your software doesn't work or your test suite is broken and, and you need to take measures. Um, and if you have uh, flake tests and sometimes they pass, sometimes they fail, uh, and you have no idea why this is, uh, obviously muta your mutation results uh, will also be unreliable and you need to take, take measures to, to fix your flake tests. Uh, the second rule is uh, when you run the test suite against uh, a mutant, that, that is a modified version of your program, um, you expect the result to be fail, and that's a good thing. Uh, when the test suite fails, uh, then we say that the mutant was killed or the mutant died. And uh, this means uh, we had at least one assertion or one condition uh, in the test suite uh, which wasn't met and uh, the test suite failed. So that means uh, at least we have uh, one test which is able to detect this change and tell us, you know, the, the software was modified. And the last thing is, which you don't want to happen, when you run your test suite against uh, the mutant and the result is pass, uh, this is a bad thing. Uh, uh, then we say we have a zombie or that the mutant survived. And uh, as you know from the movie, zombies are these things that, that go around and try to eat you. And now imagine um, you make some change in the code, uh, run the test suite, it passes, but it, it doesn't really uh, understand there's anything change. And now this change goes into production, and suddenly this becomes a bug and tries to eat you. So these are the three rules. Uh, testing against the non-modified version should pass always. Testing against the mutant should fail. Uh, this is the way mutation test uh, tools uh, figure out when you kill the mutant. When something fails in the test suite, the tool says you kill the mutant. Okay, now, uh, let's play a little game. Um, I am going to show you possible mutations, and uh, because you all know about testing, you are going to tell me what test cases I need to write to kill the mutants. Uh, I am uh, using the code from uh, earlier, the one with the 100% coverage, and only take this method. See, this is a string variable, and we return the uppercase of the string variable. That's what, what it does. Uh, so very simple. First possible mutation is uh, instead of returning the uppercase string, uh, my method under test returns new value. So what tests uh, can you propose so I can queue this? Obviously not new. Yep. Ob yes, ob obviously not new, yes, correct. So we, we execute the method under test and expect the result uh, to obviously not be new. If we, I'll go back, if we apply the mutation and run the, the test, the method will return new and the expectation will fail, everything will fail and we kill the mutant. Okay, next possible mutation. Uh, instead of returning the uppercase string, uh, I'm returning self because this uh, method is part of the class and I have access to the self object so I can do this. Uh, what test do I need uh, here to kill this mutation? Okay, type string, correct. So I must be checking what uh, the type of uh, the return value is, and if I expect only string, then it must be only string and nothing else. Uh, another possible mutation is uh, instead of returning the uppercase, I just return the, the value of this, this variable as is. So how do I kill this? Okay, so I start with uh, a value which is, uh, uh, you know, lowercase, 
And then I execute the method under test and expect this to be you know, uppercase. And I, I use this uh, with just a constant because it's easier for me. Uh, no. So this one, for example, will kill the, the first and the second zombies. Uh, and here, uh, if yeah, and here, if I start with uh, with new, okay, let me think. Uh, with the new mutation, yeah, it might kill also the first one. So some, sometimes, yeah, one of the tests is enough to kill more mutants, but. Actually, th this is the way I discovered them and I developed the tests for them and actually didn't go back to think whether or not uh, I have uh, some test which is uh, not needed. And, uh, okay, so, and the last uh, example from the game is uh, uh, replacing the, uh, this uh, ampersand. This is the new, f the new safety navigation operator in Ruby and I just replace it with a dot. Uh, so for the folks who don't uh, work with Ruby, uh, the new safety operator works this way. If the object on the left uh, is new, then the result of this operator is new and uh, nothing else is executed. And if the object on the left of the operator is not new, the execution continues to the right. And when we replace this with a dot, uh, then uh, if a language code is new, we just get a runtime exception because a new object doesn't have an a method called upcase. That's, that's the difference. So uh, we do this mutation, and uh, what what test do I need uh, to kill this? Should, not roll. Should what? Should not roll. Okay, how do you assert on that? Okay, well, at least I don't know how can I assert that there was no exception, but I can uh, set this uh, uh, variable to new, execute the method under test, and if there is an exception. The test will fail anyway, so I don't have to assert there wasn't an exception, but I can assert that the result was new. So if, if the framework asserts uh, whether an exception was not raised, then of course that's a valid answer, but I don't know how to do this with Ruby. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, uh, it collides if you read if yeah it collides if you read the uh, the examples as is on the on the uh, on the slides. Uh, what I haven't shown is that uh, this variable has a non-new value by default. So it uh, so that works then. But yeah, good good catch. <laughs> um, now let's uh, try and find some bugs with mutation testing. Uh, uh, one uh, bug that I was able to, to discover just by using mutation testing in a project, not actively looking for the bug, is, is this. So we have a class called network, which uh, represents uh, the networking settings on your Linux computer. And um, there's an attribute called self device, which is the name of the network interface. And uh, this uh, method for equality is obviously wrong, you know, as highlighted here, and we'll see why. So if self-device is none or an empty string, that piece of the Boolean expression is always evaluated to false, and the entire uh, return value is always false. So it doesn't matter what, you know, what's the other object you're comparing to, this method always returns false. And uh, if self-device isn't none or is not an empty string, uh, then which means it has some meaningful value uh, in the software, uh, this is uh, evaluated to true, and the uh, Boolean expression always depends on the second part. So, and that's actually the fix. Just, you know, just, just remove this first part of the Boolean expression, and, and here we go. The reason uh, this, this stayed undetected for, I guess, about seven or eight years is uh, there, wa there wasn't a single test in the test suite which uh, tried to test uh, this equality method when some of the attribute was an empty string or was none. So they were always testing with some valid values. And, and this went un undetected for many, many years. A and also in the software under test, uh, when you see normal conditions, this value is always, uh, it always has some value. So it doesn't, you know, uh, return a, a false or, you know, something bad happens. Uh, another book uh, which I was able to find is, uh, as uh, shown, 
I have two classes. Uh, the second class inherits uh, from the first one, and uh, you see both classes have a parameter called speed limit in the init method, and uh, both parameters have default values. Now this is perfectly valid Python code, so there's nothing wrong uh, with uh, the way it's written. I run the this through mutation testing and uh, I get a surviving mutant. The reason here is uh, th this is a constant change. The tool for Python adds a plus one to any integer constant uh, and to see what happens. And I immediately know the reason for this is that I don't have any test which creates an object from this class and asserts uh, what the default value of this attribute should be. So I create my test like this, just you know, create an object from the class under test and assert what the default value should be. And the test immediately fails, of course. And the reason for this is, uh, if you look closely, you see that uh, this uh, parameter, I'm not sending that to the init method of the parent class, so it must go here after self. And uh, w when I'm not doing this, uh, the parent class has uh, its default value, so it uses 50 instead of 90. And that's why the, my test fails. And this is also very subtle. Uh, it stayed undetected for many, many years. Uh, and also the reason for not being detected is uh, the attribute this value is assigned to uh, is never used in the software under test. Uh, it was meant to be used by external uh, clients of the software. Uh, the software in under test in this case is a library, so it's used by other tools. And apparently, you know, nobody bothered to, to check whether or not the default value is it should be. Um, another possible bug, uh, very close to the previous one, is again I have two classes. Uh, the second class inherits from the first one. Again, I have uh, a parameter with a default value, and this time, notice, I am actually sending this to uh, the init method of the parent class, and everything must be fine. I run this uh, through my mutation testing too. I get the same surviving mutant, so again, I write. Uh, the same type of test, create an object and assert what the default values of the attribute should be. Uh, and, I, and this time I get another type of uh, exception. It's an attribute error telling me object from the microwave class uh, does not have an attribute called speed limit. And at this point I start wondering why uh, this is. So, you know, I look here, everything looks cool. I look here, everything looks okay. And I traverse back uh, to the parent class and immediately here I notice uh, first there's no parameter called speed limit and then something starts you know, to look not right and then I look in the body of uh, the parent init method and uh, nobody cares about uh, whether or not there's a parameter called speed limit nobody sets an attribute called self speed limit uh, so that, that's the problem you know I don't have this one possible fix is to, if you really need this, to just take care of it in the uh, class under test and set the attribute. Or another possible fix is to delete uh, everything related to this parameter. I don't bother with it. And that was actually the fix uh, in production. Uh, another thing which uh, mutation testing is really good at is uh, uh, forcing you to look at your source code and, and refactor it. And the um, places where mutation testing uh, really shines is where you have uh, uh, if statements and uh, comparisons and lots of uh, Boolean expressions, stuff like that. Uh, the reason for this is uh, we have uh, many mutations in places like this. So in this example on the screen we have uh, around one, 100 different mutations. Every comparison operator uh, can lead to almost 10 different mutations, so equals here uh, can be replaced with non-equals, with uh, less than or greater than, less than equals, greater than equals, uh, in Python is and uh, is not, and also in and not in operators, so that many. Uh, Boolean and can be replaced with Boolean or, we can negate the entire Boolean expressions, uh, uh, also in the tool for Ruby you can replace um, the Boolean expression with a true or false constant, and I think also uh, you can change only parts of it, so you can replace this with true or false, and then leave the rest as is. And the Python 2 doesn't do this uh, at the moment, but uh, it's fairly easy to add. And uh, so this uh, goes through mutation testing, uh, and in something, uh, you know, there, there are surviving mutants. Uh, and uh, when you start looking at it, you, you notice the pattern highlighted in red. 
so my thought is I can I can delete this and move the second blo block of if statements uh, to the right and it becomes a little bit more clear and then I notice another pattern that whatever value is uh, I'm looking for an attribute under self handler with the same name and do something with it so I can refine this even further and use the get attribute function and this becomes like this uh, in reality this fits only on four lines instead of ten lines and it's much more easier to test and much more you know easier to read actually and that's a good thing uh, so uh, we've seen you know what mutation testing can do uh, it forces you to write better asserts and in my opinion uh, when you have a complex uh, software under test uh, we not only should uh, assert what the return values of our methods uh, are but we also should assert uh, what intermediate state or side effects uh, are produced by the functions under test and you will all agree that uh, it doesn't matter how much we try to write clean software we always have uh, these methods which do more than one thing at a time so they they do something some calculations return some value and oh by the way I've just set this attribute on the site just so you know and that's what mutation testing is really helpful with uh, it helps you discover these things which, which you are not testing by mutating them so you can write your tests better uh, we saw uh, we can find some interesting books and we saw that uh, we can uh, find places uh, which we can refactor and the question still stands uh, is my test suite good enough and uh, another question another side of this question is uh, how do I measure uh, how good my test suite is which metric do I use um, to tell whether or not my test suite is good um, and uh, uh, you know metrics is fairly controversial topic I just want to mention some research uh, that's been going on in the last few years in 2015 at uh, GTAC uh, there was uh, one lightning talk which says you know coverage uh, is not a good metric because it doesn't give you uh, a lot of information so go for mutation score uh, you know use mutation testing and measure how much of the mutants uh, are killed if you kill 100% of the mutants then then you're good uh, and then last year at GTAC there was another researcher who basically said well you know the guys from last year they didn't do really good research they didn't research on uh, on many software so we, we did better research and we claim that uh, the coverage metric like line coverage and branch coverage is still the best metric in practice uh, they say uh, the problem with mutation testing is uh, it is very expensive to compute and in their research uh, it gave only additional 4% of information which uh, the, res the guys didn't know already uh, compared to coverage so they say you know use coverage don't use mutation testing and uh, I decided to do a small experiment uh, and see which one of uh, these researchers uh, is right so my software under test is called uh, Pelican AB and this is uh, a very small library it's a plugin for Pelican uh, Pelican is a static HTML generator for Python which you can use to, to run your blog or your site on and uh, Pelican AB gives you uh, one additional uh, tag uh, for uh, the templating uh, markup which you can use to encode uh, varying uh, layout for your website so for example you can change uh, the cover of uh, links or covers of buttons stuff like that uh, the way to use this software is uh, to define the AB experiment variable uh, in the shell and run the make command if you run make github then the site gets rendered everything's published directly to github uh, the way to render several versions of your website is first start with the control version uh, and then uh, name each experiment by name and run make uh, in a sequence like shown on the screen and if you do this uh, the three commands then you get the control version of your website an experiment which is called 123 and everything about this experiment goes into a directory with the same name the URL structure is updated uh, and you know you can point uh, your users to only to that experiment and see how they they respond and stuff like that uh, and um, in the version under test uh, we have 100% branch and line coverage uh, of this software and we also have a book uh, there is a setting called delete output directory which is set to true by default and this setting isn't something the software under test uh, controls and yeah, th this lives into an external file where you know your website configuration goes so like stuff like uh, your website name your github handle goes into that file as well 
the bug is when that setting is set to true, uh, Pelican will go and delete uh, the output directory and delete all the HTML files and then starts rendering them in a clean directory. So the result of this command sequence uh, with the setting set to true is that you have deleted your entire website and only left with the last one. And imagine now, you know, you delete everything and type make GitHub and everything goes live. So that's a pretty good way to destroy your website. Uh, so, you know, I, I didn't have a test which uh, will fail if this setting is set to true. So I decided to integrate mutation testing into the project and I wrote a few more tests uh, to achieve 100% mutation coverage. You know, mind you, this is a very small library, very small plugin, and the bug was still present. So this means I don't have any test which fails when this setting is set to true. And I started thinking, okay, why, why I have uh, these many tests and this bug is still present? And the answer is, uh, you know, you cannot discover this type of bug uh, without looking at the external environment. And that's why we need uh, integration tests. So I added an integration test which uh, simulates uh, the external environment with the settings and simulates the make command then tries to verify uh, what content has been rendered and whether or not uh, it's correct and the test immediately failed, of course. So then uh, I said I fixed the bug, but in reality just, uh, you know, changed this uh, setting to false and also added to check whether or not this is set to true, just raise an exception in my software. Uh, and now we, we have 100% uh, mutation coverage, 100% branch coverage, and also we have in at least one integration test. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I must be good then, uh, you know, uh, if I have so many tests and I'm using these techniques, then possibly my software is bug free. And of course this is not true. Uh, I've added a PyLint uh, to the project and PyLint was immediately able to uh, discover this bug. This is, uh, this is a problem with how uh, uh, we call the super method. Instead of passing the class name, uh, I was using uh, a shortcut, which is self dot underscore class. And this works perfectly fine when you use the software uh, in its intended environment, uh, because we have only one class and self class is evaluated to that particular class's name. And everything's fine. Uh, this becomes a problem uh, the moment you try to inherit from the class under test and create a new class and do something different with it. And then when you call the uh, class under test uh, init method, uh, Python goes into a loop uh, between the, the parent and, and the inherited class init methods. So if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to learn more, just head on to this pilot pull request number and uh, there's a very detailed description why this is a problem. And um, I am guilty of uh, using this uh, this shortcut in Python, uh, but I've seen this in many, many projects uh, online at GitHub, and I've seen this uh, in popular software, which is used by many people. So this tells me uh, people don't have very good uh, understanding of what self-class actually means and how it works, and that's why you know we, we keep using it in in the wrong way. Uh, so to conclude uh, the mutation versus coverage uh, topic. Um, this is a link to my blog uh, describing my experiment with more details and uh, there are links to actual git commits and so you can see what actually what code uh, was changed and how it was changed. Um, so I think when, when we first uh, start doing testing, uh, what we look uh, at is uh, how much coverage we can do. So we strive to write more tests to test as much as possible uh, of the software under tests and that's a good thing um, uh, until some time when we uh, go to 100% coverage, we don't get any more information out of this metric, so it doesn't do any, uh, any good. Then we start looking at mutation testing and mutation testing tells us, okay, now you have some coverage and you're testing some stuff, but then, you know, there's a lot more you can test and this is, you know, what you need to do. And we start doing mutation testing and we get to 100% mutation coverage. And when we get to 100%, we don't get any more useful information out of that. And we also need integration tests because of the external environment. And as you see from the examples, we have different types of uh, environments. One type of environment is uh, the regular environment which our users will be using. And another possible type of environment is uh, 
a developer just taking our software and trying to do something else with it or you know build on top of it and we have no idea what these environments will be and how people will want to use our software so that's why we need different types of tests and uh, you know possibly we also use different types of tools to to detect the problems and, and deal with it and uh, I do need more examples on the topic I, I will be continue to explore this topic throughout the year but if you have uh, examples which you can share with me or you know publish something to github uh, please send me an email uh, now uh, I'll go to something more practical um, speed of execution so uh, as you as you can imagine mutation testing is very slow and just to measure how slow um, I've taken uh, a real-world project uh, from Fedora it's called Pi kickstart uh, it is a text parser library uh, used by the Fedora installation program. Um, it's a, a medium-sized project with a little over 100 files. Uh, I think uh, all of these files are Python modules. Uh, they don't have uh, many dependencies between each of them, uh, so that's good. Uh, each uh, module, uh, you know, does some checking, uh, a few if statements. Uh, there are hardly any loops uh, in the code. So, you know, uh, very easy to, to understand, actually. Uh, they read some text, then, then they write some text uh, as well as, as an output. And this is uh, a library which is meant to be used uh, by other programs, so it doesn't really do anything useful on its own. Um, the project has a fairly good test suite, over 90% coverage uh, with a uh, lot of uh, tests. Um, and the other good thing about it is uh, the files under the source directory a map almost one-to-one uh, uh, -one with the files under the test directory so that they have the same names uh, and the first thing I did was uh, take Cosmic Ray um, the mutation testing tool for Python and told it okay so here's the source directory which means uh, load everything into memory uh, you can find under this directory in terms of modules produce all the possible mutations you can you can produce uh, on these modules and then here is the test directory I use the test runner to discover uh, all possible cases you can discover and just you know start running and uh, I let this run on my computer that took over six days uh, then I became smarter and uh, wrote a small script to go through the source directory take only one file load this uh, in, into cosmic ray which means you know produce mutations but only for that module you know don't bother about the rest of the software only that module and oh by the way here is only one file in in the test directory which contains your test, so use only that for testing and not everything else. Um, and that was faster. I, I've also added uh, an option called fail fast, which means uh, whenever one of the tests fails, uh, we know that there was a failure and we'll kill the mutant, so don't bother to execute the rest of the cases. This is an option for the test runner. And uh, I did some refactorings, like uh, stuff like uh, if length of string uh, is greater than zero, I've replaced this with only if string. Uh, and this helped me save about 1,000 mutations, uh, which were you know, very obvious things. And I let this run. The execution time was now a little over six hours. Uh, and uh, this is a 20 times more improvement in speed of execution, but still quite slow for any practical purposes, uh, I may say. Uh, so the way to use mutation testing at the moment, in my opinion, is uh, if uh, you, you're testing a very small library or a very small project, uh, then you, you can go you know, full on uh, into CI and just uh, tell, okay, this is my command line to schedule my mutation testing jobs and let this run for 10, 15, 20 minutes uh, and that should be fine. Uh, if uh, your project is any, anything bigger than 200 lines, uh, this is not going to work very well. Uh, but what you can do is uh, create a commit hook or a pull request hook which examines the payload and you can first thing you can do is uh, schedule mutation testing only against the files which have been modified but by that particular commit or that pull request and that should should be faster next thing you can do depending on the tooling uh, is uh, go, on the, go down from the module level to the class name and to the method name which has been modified um, the Python tool doesn't know anything about classes and modules it only knows uh, and doesn't know anything about classes and methods, sorry. It only knows about modules. So regardless if you have one class or 1,000 classes uh, in one module, Python loads the entire module and starts doing mutations against everything. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the Ruby tool knows about classes and, and methods, I think. Uh, 
and you can you can tell you know that's only that particular stuff uh, and you can try and go even further uh, because this is a, a pull request or commit hook you have access to the actual diff and uh, you can apply this to to the source under test and uh, assuming you've tested everything before and it's fine then you can schedule mutations only against the lines which were changed yeah, so you can do this uh, and it's not really impractical to do this another thing you can do is uh, go into parallel uh, again depending on the tools uh, the python tool uh, is built around salary uh, so you can you can very easily hook this to some messaging backend like rabbitmq and uh, schedule you know hundreds and thousands of uh, messages and let your uh, infrastructure deploy uh, docker instances or virtual machines in the cloud and just you know run your tests in parallel just uh, get back the results and you can do this if you have a lot of money of course uh, here is a list of uh, some mutation testing tools. Uh, I have been using only the first two. Uh, I mostly use Python and I contribute to, to Cosmic Ray for Python. And uh, I've used uh, Mutant for Ruby, uh, but not very actively at the moment. Uh, and the, name to the, the names to the rights are GitHub repositories. Uh, okay, so uh, as far as I know, uh, the tools on the top uh, are based on the abstract, abstract syntax tree of the language and they are language specific so whatever you know you want to do in the tool it works uh, on ASTs it modifies uh, the nodes of the AST uh, one thing I like to do is uh, look at the other tools and see what they're doing especially in terms of uh, mutation operators and try to bring these uh, to Python so if you if you want to actively use mutation testing uh, I really advise you to look at tools for other languages and see how they work and how they are doing uh, because many of the, the tools are very new, they are not very mature uh, and um, on the bottom uh, this is another uh, tool for mutation testing called the Mule project uh, which Alex Denisov will be presenting later today so I'll, I'll definitely be checking, out, checking this out, this is an LLVM based tool so it should work for uh, several different languages uh, if you are into mutation testing, also check this out. Uh, and now before I can uh, go further, uh, I can take some questions from the audience, if you like. Okay, go. Okay, so the question is uh, if we have a zombie uh, and but we have 100% uh, cold, cold coverage, does it mean that coverage was wrong? At the first place, and yeah. the lines are hidden within the language itself. Yeah, okay, so uh, it doesn't mean coverage was uh, wrong, like, I mean, it, it doesn't mean the metric, the measurement mm -hmm. was wrong, it, it's, it was probably correct. Uh, there are other problems with coverage, like, for example, if you have one line with lots of... Uh, with a long boolean expression then it still gets covered regardless of how much of that expression is evaluated so you may be evaluating only the first part of the expression uh, and still cover that line but you know the next 10 parts of the boolean expression are not evaluated Yeah, yeah, well, the way to count, you know, th th these uh, cases is you should take this up to the, to the tools, to the authors of tools who do coverage. Uh, but th there are many, many publications online uh, uh, with respect to problems in coverage and why it's not really a good metric, why you shouldn't use coverage. And really, for me, coverage is, is a vanity metric. Uh, it, it really tells you how much of the, you know, of the lines you've covered, but nothing more. It doesn't tell you anything more. Uh, and if you have a zombie on a line which was covered, this simply means uh, you might have executed this line, uh, but probably you didn't assert, assert on some condition, uh, or you know you asserted on one condition and you needed to assert on two conditions. Well, I have a comment to 
exactly. Okay. Basically, this is a difference between uh, line coverage, statement coverage, and branch coverage. Yes, if yes. If you have 100% branch coverage, then uh, it's unlikely that you will have 100% uh, uh, coverage and have, uh, have zombies. Uh, but most of the tools uh, count only line coverage, and very few ca count even statement coverage, not to mention uh, branch coverage. Okay, we have a question there. Yes, so uh, this works really well with primitive uh, operations that want to change, you know, less than, greater than, plus, plus into plus two, that kind of thing. Uh, what if uh, you're not using primitives for your business logic? What if you're using a library, especially on JavaScript, but I don't know about Ruby, that does all your conditions for you with functions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, qu yeah, the question is, uh, what if we... We don't use primitives, we use some library uh, for the business logic. Uh, how does mutation testing come into play? Well, this is uh, very dependent on the tools that you use. Uh, so, for example, the, the Python tool until, re until recently, uh, it was very poor on mutation operators because it's a new tool and not many people use it. On the other hand, uh, the Ruby tool called Mutant, I think this is one of the best tools uh, currently in existence. And it has tons of uh, mutation operators, tons of conditions. Uh, it understands because it's used by people who work on commercial software. They get paid to actually write test suites for commercial software, and they support the tool uh, for that reason. Um, about JavaScript, I, I don't really have no no idea. I don't use JavaScript, uh, but really, the you know, the take here is you need to know your tools very well, and you need to know the software very well. And that, that's when you can decide whether or not that's going to be useful. Now, maybe, maybe in your case, you might write a plugin or you know, an extension to the tool and produce the mutation based on the functions in, in that particular library. OK? Question here. Yeah, so um, thank you for your talk. Um, academia claims that the biggest problem of mutation testing is equivalent mutants. Um, can you say something about them? Uh, how often do you see them in production? Or is it something that you struggle with in practice? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the question was about equivalent mutants. Um, equivalent mutants are things like, uh, which uh, you know change the code but don't really change behavior in any practical way. So, for example, we may have uh, a less than operator, uh, which uh, in practice is equivalent to less than or equal, um, if we you know depending on the values we accept in the application. And uh, I don't have any uh, concrete measure about this. Uh, in practice, but I think about 10 or 15 percent of the time I see equivalent mutants. Equivalent mutants, beca because the behavior doesn't change, but the syntax changes, but the behavior doesn't change, the test suite doesn't fail, and we cannot kill them, and they just stay as is. Um, uh, in, in the projects I, I use mutation testing for, I don't, I usually have some uh, threshold, uh, like about 10 percent or something like that, and if uh, uh, the, the mutant score is, uh, you know, above a certain line, then I say we're good, and then the, the CI system goes green. And if we drop uh, under that line, then we go red and inspect what's happening. A and that threshold is based on how many equivalent mutants I have. So I try to, you know, get some idea about that and then go, go from there. Um, I've talked to other people who do mutation testing and have been doing mutation tests for um, a long, long time. Uh, and this is a problem, but still the, the benefits you get from uh, asserting on all those different conditions and looking at your code base and understanding the software much more better, uh, which is a result of mutation testing, uh, it just, uh, you know, the benefit is greater than having to deal with equivalent mutants. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, more questions or no questions? We have two minutes, so uh, there are, if there are no more questions, I'll just uh, show you this very quickly. Uh, I have started to document my findings uh, about mutation testing, so first of all, I don't forget them, and some of them make really good examples. Uh, this is available on Read the Docs, and it's also available on uh, GitHub uh, if you'd like to contribute. And uh, it, uh, since the last week, we have also Chinese translation uh, for this. And uh, I'll skip the trivial examples and show you the last one. So we have uh, we have this uh, 
In Python, it's fairly common to have uh, methods for equality, which compare two objects uh, by comparing uh, that uh, all of the attributes uh, are equal. So in this example, we have a class called sandwich, and you can modify the meat of your sandwich and the bread type of your sandwich. And we say that two sandwiches are equal if uh, meat and, and bread attributes are equal. And that's about it. You now we have a, a safety check here. If the other object is none, then it or false. And the not equals method is just a negation of the equals. And the way to test this uh, with mutation testing is uh, like so. So we, we create two test objects, sandwich one and sandwich two. By default, uh, all of their attributes have uh, a value of uh, empty string, uh, which is not shown on the screen. And first thing we do is uh, test the test for equality. They should be equal uh, because uh, everything is an empty string uh, inside these objects. And uh, we also assert that uh, the two objects are not, you know, when compared for non-equality, it returns false. And that takes care of uh, half of the testing. Uh, then we test the safety check compared to none and expect uh, to not be equal. And then comes the fun part, the way to... So this starts changing into uh, different comparison operators and the way to test is uh, like this. So we, we need to modify only one of the attributes at uh, one of the test object and leave the rest uh, of the attributes and the other object unchanged. And we need to do this for every single attribute. So uh, when all the attributes are of the same type, you just do this. And if uh, they're not of the same type, you can do grouping or something like that to, you know, to modify this block. So when the time's up, so thank you very much.